Good afternoon and welcome. If we ever see everyone is gathering, we'll just allow get started here in a few more minutes. Let a few more of you get finished signing on. All right, here we go. Good afternoon. I'm Trixie Ann Goldberg. I am the Director of Development for Academic Medicine here at Banner Health Foundation. Having had a chance to visit with so many of you who are joining us today, I'm so pleased that you are with us. I know you are gonna take a lot away from today's discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce our host and moderator for Notes from the Rhythm section, Dr. Michael Fallon, who is chair of the Department of Medicine at Banner University Medicine, Phoenix. As chair, Dr. Fallon provides executive leadership to many of the multidisciplinary Banner Health Institutes here in Phoenix, including our Heart Institute. Dr. Fallon has been instrumental in advancing excellence in Banner's flagship academic medical center. Dr. Fallon also serves as executive director for clinical research and is an award-winning professor. Dr. Fallon's medical training includes Yale University School of Medicine, Yale New Haven Hospital, and University of Virginia School of Medicine. Good afternoon, Dr. Fallon. So, so thank you, Trixie Ann. It's really a pleasure to be here. I, um, so as I was looking over this last night, uh, my wife, who's a, a classically trained singer, um, said, oh, notes from the rhythm section. I, I really want to be on that. And so then I told her it was what it was going to be about, and she said, okay, forget it. So um, um, she, uh, though, uh, when I showed her some of Pete's and Mike's and Wilbur's slides, she was really intrigued about what's going on. And so it's really a pleasure to, to be part of this group um, and, and to bring to you this uh, this notes from the rhythm section. Uh, next slide, please, Dorothy. So I wanted to first frame our discussion tonight around this concept of academic medicine. Many people uh, see academic medicine the way I see these buildings. The building on the left is the new Banner University Medical Center Phoenix, which is our flagship academic hospital. But it's really where we provide clinical care and we have uh, Banner University physicians, community physicians, and then, and then physicians across the valley who provide care. So many people see clinical care in one building. The building on the right is our uh, University of Arizona Bioscience Research Partnership Building, linked to our Banner University medical campus, but it's a research building where we see um, advances in translational medicine, where we use cell culture, where we um, do experiments um, and, and look at genetics and genomics. And so when many people think of academics, they think of, well, you're, if you're academics, you're doing that stuff in the copper building. And if you're a clinician, you're doing stuff in the hospital building. So next slide. Uh, so what I'd like to, 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 to change this framework is to say, one of the key pillars of academic medicine is superb innovative clinical care. And the base of that is clinical skills. Um, everyone has to be extremely well trained and have clinical skills. But it requires innovation, technology, research, and education to move the arrow further. And then when we put all that together, we're, we're able to provide world-class care, create new knowledge about how to make people better, and then more effective therapies that are safer, and then we also train the next generations. So the two blue arrows on the bottom really define what happens in academic medicine broadly. And in the field of electrophysiology, this doesn't happen in a copper building away from the, from the hospital. It happens in the hospital with the three people that you're gonna hear from today. So I would, when you think about, well, what could I do or how can I support academic medicine? You just look at the two arrows on the bottom. We need to be able to innovate, create new technology, use it, uh, apply research and education so that can, we can end up with world-class care, new knowledge, more effective therapies, and trains the next generation of superb academic clinicians. So that's what academic medicine is about. And as you hear uh, Pete and uh, Wilbur and Mike talk about 
what they do, you can, you can place it within this framework of academic medicine. Okay, next slide. So the first talk tonight is, is gonna be by Pete Weiss on robotic navigation and electrophysiology, uh, partnering with technology in the care of our patients. So Pete uh, has been a member of the Banner University Medical Center U of A team since September of last year, after working for 14 years at Salt Lake for Intermountain Healthcare. Dr. Weiss joined the team to support Dr. Sue in building a world-class EP program within the growing Banner U of A partnership. His assistance furthers the development of the UMCP into a true academic and clinical center of excellence. Dr. Weiss's title here, you can see, uh, is his uh, title is Director of Ventricular Arrhythmia Management and Robotics. And this highlights his interest and extensive experience in taking care of some of the most complex and challenging arrhythmias and in working with advanced technologies in robotics. So uh, Dr. Weiss, excited to have you here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fallon. Really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you all. Uh, and uh, really the opportunity to work in this incredible uh, facility with so many wonderful people, hopefully building the future of medicine in Phoenix and, and beyond. Um, if we could uh, go to uh, the next slide. Um, I'm actually gonna ask you to kind of think outside the box a little bit for a moment uh, and uh, outside of medicine for a moment and think about the big picture of what we're all trying to accomplish. And I think obviously having a mission and then thinking about how we're gonna get there is really the key. So you might be familiar of course with the uh, company SpaceX and you know, Elon Musk and this big rocket that took off uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, really with this mission of changing humanity by going to Mars. Uh, and that was a really amazing thing to see because it really pointed to uh, some of the incredible work that's being done to really forward what's going on uh, for our society. But if we look at the next slide, uh, we'll see that even though that rocket that blasted off there was such a big and impressive uh, piece of technology uh, that really, it was a significant advance, but it was really just evolution from long existing technology. Because if you'll remember, uh, 50 years ago, the Saturn V rocket, which is actually bigger and more powerful than that Falcon rocket, uh, took human beings to the moon 50 years ago. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see that the actual paradigm shifting technology was not so much the big rocket taking off, but it was these boosters that were landing. And, you know, as, as it says here, you know, this is really the revolution in space flight that took place there uh, because the reusability of those boosters created the economics for success. Uh, in the past, it would be like taking all of us on a big airplane to London and then throwing away the airplane when we got there. Right. And so how do we create these paradigm shifting technologies that will really move things forward? And it's not always the obvious or big flashy thing that you think about. So I just want you to think about what it means to shift a paradigm, to use new technology uh, to really move us forward as far as our mission. And if you look at the next slide, uh, we'll see really what this mission means. Uh, you know, this is the mission statement taken right off the UMC uh, website. Uh, of course, it's to say we want to make health, making healthcare easier so life can be better. And with that come the core values also straight from the website of being customer obsessed, relentless improvement, and to courageously innovate. So to stretch that into what we're doing in the Heart Rhythm Institute, uh, also our mission here, uh, I'm going to shrink this down for a sec, uh, which would be to uh, provide optimal heart rhythm care through technology and compassion and to improve the lives of our patients through thoughtful application of treatments that are optimized for their safety and effectiveness. And if you look at the next slide, uh, one of the main procedures that we do here, and you're gonna hear more, more about uh, going forward is called catheter ablation. Uh, and this is a minimally invasive procedure that we use to treat heart rhythm disorders. We do this daily here, uh, over a thousand procedures each year. And to do this, we use catheters or long skinny tubes that are threaded from uh, the groin access usually uh, to the heart through the blood vessels through very small puncture sites. And we use these catheters then to diagnose and treat the short circuits that cause the heart to beat abnormally. Uh, success in doing that really does depend on getting the tools that we're using to go where they need to go. And then once we get there to successfully diagnose uh, the problem and then deliver therapy. And of course, with the key idea in mind of first do no harm. So that asks us, what are the standard tools that we've been using and are they well suited for the task? And I think you'll see on the next slide uh, that there are some issues there. Uh, the manual catheters that we use, 
thanks for playing the video. Uh, they have a handle where you can control a lever that makes the catheter move into a curve and then you have to push it from below. And because of that, the, cath the catheters have to be stiff. They have to be pushed from below. And if you put that into a moving, dynamic, flexible system like the heart, you'll see that there's a real mismatch here. You can see this picture here, which is an ultrasound picture of one of the main heart chambers, left ventricle. And you see that catheter in there that's just bouncing around. Sometimes it's in contact, sometimes it's not. And you can imagine that if we're trying to make a good diagnosis and deliver therapy, that there's going to be some challenges there. This is maybe not optimal. Um, yet that's what we have been using for the past 20 years in doing this kind of work. It's kind of amazing we can accomplish what we have. But uh, if we go to the next slide, it raises the question of can we do this in a better way? There is a technology mismatch in what we've been doing before. Uh, so let's go to the next uh, slide. And if we play the videos here, you'll see that we have an option here, which is magnetic navigation. Uh, and if you can see me, you'll see I'm actually sitting in this room where we have this technology. But the idea here is that instead of a stiff catheter that gets bounced around inside this moving system, we use a flexible dynamic catheter that is then matched to the flexible dynamic moving heart. The catheter is able to move in multiple planes, any direction we'd like. It is, instead of being stiff, is actually flexible, almost like a wet noodle, and is moved around by a magnetic field. Uh, so because of that, as you'll see in, in the demonstration here, we can direct it to go anywhere we'd like to go. And you see on the next slide, it has other advantages as well. If you play the video, you'll see on the left that the magnetic catheter on the left is in continuous contact with the tissue surface. That allows really optimal diagnosis and treatment as opposed to that typical stiff catheter that you see on the right. And then in addition, because the catheter is flexible, you can't poke a hole in the heart, okay? I know it might sound simple and it is in a sense, but it's also one of the scarier things that can happen with traditional ablation procedures. Uh, literally the catheter could poke a hole in the heart and with more than 120,000 procedures done worldwide with this magnetic technology, there's never been a hole poked in the heart mechanically. And of course that adds to the safety. So the idea here is, is that we can hopefully optimize both precision and safety with the work we're doing uh, with this new technology. Uh, on the next slide, then you'll see, and it can be a little hard to see, but there's sort of that bright spot at the top of the picture. And then if you follow that, you'll see that there's a catheter stuck to that. And what we see there is a catheter moving with the heart in continuous contact delivering therapy. Um, so really this catheter is capable of doing uh, what we'd like it to do uh, for that reason. Less of a mismatch, more of a match between the technology uh, and the therapy we're trying to deliver. Now the next slide, uh, I'll show you kind of how it's done, okay? Uh, basically, a computer mouse is moved to actually do all the work from a computer console. That then moves the direction of a magnetic field that's delivered by these uh, big magnets. In fact, you can see behind me one of the magnets uh, right there that's covered now. Uh, and then the catheter moves in that direction. So really, all the work, instead of being done standing next to the patient, is done from a computer console by moving the mouse and then moving the catheter uh, based on what you see here. And the next slide... This is a picture of the lab. I'm actually sitting in the same lab right now, okay? Uh, but actually uh, doing the work from the big computer screen with the patient then uh, out in the room beyond. Uh, on the next slide. Uh, you know, so this system is clearly very useful for doing tough stuff. Uh, and over the years, and I've been doing this for more than 10 years, uh, more than a thousand procedures myself, we've done some very complicated procedures where, you know, you can see the cats are going all different directions, right? You know, and... Uh, that's something that just can't be done with a regular catheter. You know, like this guy who's sort of stuck in that odd position, you can do some crazy things with this catheter and treat some patients that cannot be treated otherwise. But you see on the next slide, it's really important to think about this, not just as a tool uh, for, uh, oh, hold on one second. It's giving me an error on my computer. Um, you know, it's not, it's important this tool not just be looked at as something for special procedures, but instead for day to day work. And again, there's been more than 120,000 procedures completed worldwide. There's been more than 400 publications about the use of this system in clinical medicine, uh, including uh, more than 50 with head to head comparisons. And this is true in all sorts of different arrhythmias. We're going to hear more about atrial fibrillation in the future, uh, part of today's talk. Um, but really, the clear thing is that not only can this be used in special circumstances, but also brought in to our use uh, daily as well. In our next slide, uh, we'll see some of the neat things uh, 
that can be put together because we've got the technology now allowing us to navigate in the heart safely and accurately. What happens if we integrate that with advanced mapping, advanced imaging, which lets us better understand the anatomy that they're working in? Let's go to the next slide. So, you know, this is an example of one of our advanced mapping tools and won't go into this too much detail, but, you know, we have these incredible systems now that let us understand the heart rhythms better in real time. Uh, here we're seeing what it looks like to demonstrate atrial fibrillation, a complex arrhythmia in the heart by looking at color coded graphics showing the direction of electrical flow and that sort of thing. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we also here see, this is actually a procedure we did in this new lab just a couple of weeks ago where we brought in uh, advanced CT imaging in three dimensions to interface with our three-dimensional mapping and then move around using this computerized system all together. Uh, and you can really see the advancements that are being made in our ability to understand what we're treating. We go to the next slide, then, you know, if we put together then this advanced technology allowing us to move around in the heart, get where we need to go and deliver therapy once we've mapped, integrate that with advanced mapping, then we develop tools that are really coming together to bring the next step, what you might call medicine 3.0 here, to really bring automation to patient care. Uh, next slide, please. So the question is, why would we want to do this? Okay, why move towards automation? Well, if you think about all different areas of high technology in our world, it's very clear that human error is really one of the key pieces of the puzzle. Uh, certainly in manufacturing, some of you may be familiar in working in those areas, human error is thought to account for up to 80% of failures and defects that occur. Uh, and why should that not be true in medicine like it is everywhere else? Uh, of course, it takes a little longer to get this aspect of things into medicine, and, and maybe it should because of the consequences involving patient care, but we're really now putting together technology to bring this along. If you look at the next slide, We'll see that they're actually pretty late to the party as far as this, this goes in medicine. We see areas of general surgery, uh, urologic surgery, gynecologic surgery already being heavily influenced by the use of robotics and automation. Uh, the work we do is extremely complex in electrophysiology, treating heart rhythm problems. So again, maybe it makes sense that it's taking a little longer to get there, but really the tools are starting to come together uh, to bring this all uh, together for our patients. And if you go to the next slide, uh, finally, I want you to, again, start to think big here, okay, about what is going on and what we have to offer and what we're trying to harness here. It was 1997 when IBM's Deep Blue supercomputer beat Gary Kasparov at chess, okay? That was a big event. Chess is a complicated game. We never thought computers would ever get there, okay? But in 1997, ever since 1997, computers, hardware, software have been better than human beings at playing chess. If you go to the next slide, we'll think even more forward, okay? So fast forward from 1997 to now, okay? Uh, all these years, 30 years. Well, now we've got inter interactive uh, machine learning and uh, this Alpha Zero AI from Google was a really incredible thing. It was invented actually to play the game Go and actually a much more complicated game and actually beat humans at that. But the key thing, really amazing, is that this tool was given four hours to learn the basic rules of chess. It was given the just the basic rules, no history, no strategy, no nothing, and taught itself in four hours to play chess to the extent where it beat the world's best chess machine at chess, which had already beaten the best human 30 years ago, okay? So this is what we're dealing with now. We have this technology that we can harness and bring to our human, uh, to our care of humans. So the bottom line is that once the technology bests humans at a task, it leaves us behind rapidly, never looks back. And if you see on the next slide, you know, why should we then pursue this uh, in our care of people? Well, you know, the bottom line is we become really excellent technicians in order to um, overcome some of the limitations of the tools that we've been working with for so long. And that human error and the iterations of existing technology can't be, you know, can't be used to fully overcome some of these limitations. Uh, instead, we have to really shift the paradigm. And in virtually every other industry, including other areas of medicine, advances in hardware and software really superseded our human manual abilities alone. So it really is time we think now for EP 3.0 uh, to really move toward that next paradigm. Uh, and we hope to be able to bring that to you and our patients uh, here in the Phoenix area and beyond. Um, and we again invite you then to save the day uh, with us by being robotic hero. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, and you can go to the next one. And thank you so much uh, for your time and attention. Appreciate it. So Pete, thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. I, I'm just going to ask you one real quick uh, question. How did you get interested in robotics? Is this a background you have or is this since you were a kid? What, what, 
What happened? Yeah, it's Mike. It's a very interesting question. Believe it or not, I was a philosophy major. I'm not an engineer. Um, and so I've always sort of come from the bigger thinking uh, side of things in a sense. Um, but I've also always been interested in technology and its applications uh, to healthcare and certainly did much of my research during fellowship in that area. Um, in my prior practice and here, I've always been sort of the new technology adopter and, and, and I've really enjoyed the uh, ability to play with the new technologies, try and figure out whether it's truly useful in taking care of our patients, uh, find out where it fits into the whole bigger picture. So, um, and finally, I'm, I guess I'm never in a hurry, right? And it takes time to learn how to use and, and uh, perfect these new technologies as well. So it's really been an area that I've enjoyed uh, in bringing both the technology and the human side together uh, to help uh, build this partnership between technology and healthcare. Great, Pete, thank you very much, superb. So My now pleasure. we'll move on to our, our next talk. I will remind the audience that we will have a little bit of time, hopefully at the end for questions. So you can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to, to ask questions that I will, uh, I will forward to our speakers. So our second speaker is uh, Dr. Wilbur Sue. Uh, Wilbur is, is, is really the uh, uh, director of cardiac electrophysiology at Banner, Banner University Medical Center and an associate professor of medicine at the University of Arizona and at Stanford University Medical Center. Um, Wilbur's really been our uh, leader, uh, developed the program uh, from its inception. He has a background in biomedical engineering and a biomedical engineering degree from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and received his training at Mayo Clinic Rochester uh, for medicine, cardiology, um, uh, clinical investigator fellowship, and cardiac electrophysiology. He's been an incredibly high volume operator and served as a training physician in both implantable cardiac devices and complex uh, ablation around the globe, notably in atrial fibrillation. He's recognized as a key thought leader around the world and a leader in cryoablation, uh, cryoballoon ablation. He's personally performed over 3,000 cryo balloon ablation procedures for atrial fibrillation, the highest volume in the world uh, uh, to date. Not only that, Wilbur is a uh, relentless uh, technology innovator and uh, clinical investigator. So we're really, really excited to have Wilbur Sue talk to about talk to us about AFib and arrhythmia innovations and innovators. Wilbur. Thank you, Dr. Fallon, for the kind intro. And, you know, I just wanted to take a moment to say, you know, you can see the team of electrophysiologists that we have assembled here. And, you know, you just heard Dr. Weiss and what, uh, you know, what, what, how lucky we are to have him join Banner University Medical Center and really provide a state of the art robotic care. And really, that, that makes us really the only center with all available technology in the Southwest. So you now going forward in just kind of going through to see, well, can give you a good idea of what we do. Most patients seeing us, uh, whether it's direct referral or even uh, referral from other physicians, one of the most commonly asked question is, you're a cardiac electrophysiologist. What is it that you do? And you know, what does that have to do with my heart? So just a quick diagram of who we are and really we're a subspecialist of medicine docs. And you can see in the diagram that, you know, in the medicine, you kind of, you, know, you have the surgeons, you have the cardiologists and the subspecialty that takes care of the heart. But within cardiology, there is a, a division between the heart electricians and the heart plumbers. And we're the heart electricians because even though the heart pumps like your typical plumbing to make sure you circulate the blood around, how fast and how slow the heart goes is all determined by electricity. So anything that goes right, we're in charge of that. Let's see the next slide. So there are a lot of new toys and equipment that comes with this field. And um, you may have heard that I, I was engineering major in fact, when I um, changed my uh, career goal from engineering to medicine, my parents were quite disappointed because we already have five physicians in the family, by th I think about 30 some in the extended family, and we needed an engineer. But this is probably as engineering as it gets in medicine, because as I learned more about 
cardiac electrophysiology while I was an engineering major doing different projects. And this is what I learned that in this field, we have technology that's challenged, engineering that's challenged to the apex of what engineering can do. And that's what makes this field very, very exciting. Uh, Dr. Weiss talked about catheter that can be moved around and we have catheters that actually in all shapes and forms to try to do different things. Cryo balloon, as it refers to one of the common diseases, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a very common uh, disease process. It's a, um, one of the most commonly common presentations in our field. Uh, as, a, as we speak, there are 5 million people in the U.S. with it. And um, so this is a disease that we see on a daily basis. And crowd balloon ablation, uh, as it turned out, was happened, happens to be one of the projects I worked on 20 years ago. And one of the original patents on freezing inside the heart was actually uh, uh, produced by a lab that I worked in. So one of the first uh, a catheter that was uh, used to freeze uh, tissue is I actually built it out uh, essentially in a garage type of thing in, uh, in Boston, where I worked with Dr. Uh, Paul Wong at that time to actually uh, uh, create a lesion by freezing. And this actually developed as my career developed, and this kind of came around in a full circle to where the treatment of atrial fibrillation using cryo or freezing uh, came about. So we were, so I was very eager to use this technology to be able to treat this disease process. And um, we have always been a very high volume and clinical leader in doing this. So I will just highlight that what we have done in this field. So uh, let's see the next slide. So this procedure and has really grown with our career so far. And um, with every new iteration of the catheter, every, with every uh, learning process, uh, we adopt the scientific uh, process and be able to really refine what we do. And with the goal of how do we provide the safest procedure, the most effective procedure to the patient. And uh, with our experience so far, we were able to first author really the guideline or the Bible on how to do this procedure. And these are the best guidelines as well as adopt, uh, adopted by uh, users around the world. Uh, next slide. And really, we don't stop at that. You know, we look at ways of using this technology to treat just uh, beyond what a typical AFib is. And we have ways to try to optimize the procedure so that um, any potential harm can be minimized. You know, use the least amount of radiation, uh, the fastest procedure that we can do in the left atria and still have the best outcome. Uh, next slide. So for you know the work that we have done and the volume we have done, and you know we continue to be able to provide really the latest care. And even for atrial fibrillation that's more complex, we were the leading author in an institution that has just published this trial. This actually is fresh in press and uh, hopefully it'll be in print uh, in the next month. Next slide. So the key, I think, to success in this field for us really comes down to being the leading edge of the latest and greatest. I think you know, the ability for us as the entire faculty to have a high volume and you know, high precision, an excellent team that support us in the labs really help us put uh, put a uh, banner on the podium so far. Uh, we are you know, both Pete and myself and Mike were leading uh, investigators in multiple trials, and uh, that really becomes a you know, leads to you know, notoriety in what we do, and uh, hopefully you know, this also leads to uh, bringing the latest and greatest technology to our patients. So, so far, even with just a crowd balloon that we have done, uh, we have uh, physicians that travel from around the U.S. when U.S. first got uh, initiated with this. So we have really taught over 300 physicians around the U.S. right here in Banner University Medical Center. We also have done worldwide uh, to Canada, Hawaii, 
Really, we just did a live case to uh, Portugal last week uh, because you know when we look at how we you know, perform our procedure with the latest precision uh, to have the best outcome, the safest uh, process, and they actually have looked to us as the role model. Next. So this also brings us the latest technology that will bring to us. So uh, some of the new technologies are, for example, this the mapping vest that actually we can put outside on the patient to try to predict arrhythmias before we even get in there. Next. And recently, another company came out with a, essentially a better tool set for, and we actually just initiated a trial. And here is the enrolling our first patient in this new trial. So, Really, the key though is uh, promoting and providing the information to our patients. So this we are continuing to work on, but there are patient advocates uh, such as the afib.org uh, or stopaf.org, and all these different uh, websites we have collaborated with to give the all the patients the latest information on how to treat the uh, disease process like atrial fibrillation. So, well, of course, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, the key is to have the patient outcome. That is to have the best outcome with the minimal amount of uh, risk exposed to the patient. And uh, I think ever since about um, 10 years ago, when we started with the crowd balloon ablation, on the bottom right, actually, the, what was interesting is we started seeing a lot of uh, Hawaii patients coming over. Really, that just start with the patient. We don't advertise out there, but then the patient tells the physician that they found us. And next thing we know, now just about every month for a patient coming from Hawaii, and we just did one a week ago uh, from Hawaii. And uh, you might have heard the story about a patient who actually had this procedure done and he had atrial fibrillation. There's no way that he was going to uh, skill uh, do a uh, climbing Mount Everest, which was his. Uh, uh, one of his bucket list type of things to do. And after the procedure, he was able to train and actually was able to summit Mount Everest. So the, you know, these are the little story that kind of keeps us going and this is what drives us. And um, on the bottom left, you see that you know, we did not make this shirt up. <laughs> this, this is a shirt that's made by a patient. Um, at, you know, unfortunately, he actually spelled my name wrong with the B-U-R, but that's what, I thought it was pretty cute. But this is what really drives us in what we do at the end of the day. And um, I'll actually, I will end right here. And uh, I think hopefully that gives a glimpse into what we have done in the atrial fibrillation world, especially uh, some of the newer technology like uh, crowd balloon. Uh, but I think that's just a little sliver of what we have done in the uh, EP world amongst everything else we do here. Thank you. So while we're, Incredible work, um, really, really fascinating, um, and and I love the 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 innovation technologies we talked about in the initial slides. Uh, what's going on? So here's my question, real quick question, because I, I want to move on to Mike. But um, so how do, wh where do you find time to do all this? So you're you're doing you're the most high volume operator. You're doing research. You're advancing the technology. Uh, do you what, what do you do? You get to see your family. What 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 goes on? <laughs> I do have five kids last time counted. <laughs> so, no way, you know, this, this, this really becomes part of our life. And uh, we have, uh, you know, really comes with the support of wife, right? To support what we do. We do live in the lab sometimes, but this is what we do. And uh, when you have passion for what you do, it really, not, not, nothing seems like work, right? So we live here. <laughs> Great. So I, I'm, I'm wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing some um, questions in the chat box. So what I'm going to do is uh, have Mike uh, Zawani talk to us, and, and then we will get back to, to uh, some questions from the audience. So uh, we can go to the next slide. So the, the final talk this evening uh, is from uh, Dr. Michael Zawani. Uh, Dr. Zawani has been a member of the uh, Banner University Medical uh, Center Cardiology Division since 2019. He's an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Arizona. He graduated from medical school at the University of Florida, completed residency in internal medicine uh, and fellowship in cardiology at Case Western Reserve University in uh, Cleveland. And then he went on to complete an advanced fellowship in cardiac electrophysiology at the Cleveland Clinic. 
Prior to joining Banner, uh, Dr. Zawani uh, practiced electrophysiology in both Scottsdale and Phoenix for eight years. And he is very interested in the management of therapy for complex heart arrhythmias and implantable device therapy. Um, he's quite active in the training and education of our cardiac, uh, uh, cardiovascular fellows. And so uh, Dr. Zawani is gonna talk about exciting advances in cardiac pacing and monitoring. Dr. Zawani. Thank you, Dr. Fallon. And um, uh, I wanna thank everybody for uh, joining us today and uh, thank uh, Trixie Ann uh, for setting this up. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to be here today. So um, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about the other side uh, uh, or other face of the coin when it comes to uh, cardiac electrophysiology. And uh, this is uh, device therapies um, that are a big part of our life as well. Uh, and uh, you know, Dr. Sue and Dr. Weiss gave us an amazing presentation and all the wonderful advances in technology uh, when it comes to uh, arrhythmia ablation. And um, another part of uh, our, our daily lives in the electrophysiology laboratory are uh, uh, arrhythmia managed by devices. Um, device therapy has evolved tremendously over the course of the past 60 years, and there have been many milestones in, um, in uh, uh, the, the growth and development of, uh, of uh, pacemakers. And if we could go back just uh, for a second, I wanna show you guys um, how things have evolved. Uh, you know, in the top left corner, you see the first uh, um, mobile pacemaker where uh, uh, folks would wear it around their neck with two wires introduced through the chest into the heart. Uh, and then pacemaker evolved into the first implantable pacemaker, which we can see in the bottom left chamber, uh, bottom left corner, excuse me. And then this device um, uh, developed over the course of about uh, 50 years since the early 1960s until we have the implantable pacemaker, which is in the form it is today in the right bottom chamber. Um, so there've been, there been some great milestones in how we got from carrying a pacing device around your neck to having a small device implanted under the skin that provides uh, life support. So I wanna show you a little bit and discuss with you a little bit of the upcoming um, uh, advances and new milestones in, in pacing uh, and, and implantable uh, heart devices, which we're very excited to have at uh, Banner University and uh, very excited to be a part of. Um, and I think these uh, four points that I'm going to talk about uh, are the new milestones in, in uh, heart um, uh, in implantable devices. So the first, uh, the first is leadless pacing. And um, you'll see on the next slide how uh, the conventional way we've uh, implanted uh, pacemakers um, involved a device which was implanted under the skin in the left upper chest with a wire that goes uh, through the veins in the arm and the chest and down into the heart. And you can see the wire implant into the uh, right bottom chamber of the heart. And on the other screen and the other, excuse me, small um, uh, 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 window, you can see uh, a similar pacemaker, but with two wires going down to the heart. And this has been the traditional way we've implanted pacemakers for uh, near 40 years now um, uh, through the veins in the chest. Uh, now, the, the new and exciting technology, which you can see on the next screen, is the implantable, is the leadless pacemaker. Um, and uh, on the next screen after that, uh, you will see what this uh, leadless pacemaker is. It's a tiny, tiny uh, capsule sized device that we directly implant into the heart without any wires traversing through veins, without a device into the chest. And this entire device, which is the size of a small capsule, does uh, the entire job that a pacemaker would do. Um, and you'll see on the next slide, which I wanted to share is how we implant uh, these devices. We deliver them with a catheter through the groin and up into the heart. And um, the catheter allows us to deliver this uh, small device directly into the heart. And this whole thing is a pacemaker. Um, the, the most of the device is taken up by the battery, which lasts about seven to eight years and uh, it uh, anchors into the heart with small little metal prongs uh, that hold it in place. And um, this has essentially taken over um, the, uh, the uh, role of the single chamber pacemaker or the single wire pacemaker. And you can see on the next slide is how 
pacemakers generally have uh, the device implanted to the chest with the wires like we saw in the cartoon delivered down to the heart. Uh, and then on the other window, you will see that small little device implanted directly into the heart, which will do the job of the, um, of the traditional implanted pacemaker. So this is very exciting. This offers a tremendous amount of options for uh, folks who, uh, who don't uh, have um, the appropriate veins uh, or conduits to get us down to the heart with traditional pacemakers and have made pacema pacemaker implants really um, um, much more of a, of a feasible thing uh, in, in more complex uh, settings. Um, so the next milestone I'd like to uh, describe to you um, is left ventricular pacing. And now on the next screen, you'll see that, uh, you know, over the course of the last uh, 25 years, uh, actually almost 30 years now, um, we've been able to pace both sides of the heart by implanting a wire on the right bottom chamber and then implanting a wire to the left bottom chamber. We cannot leave wires in the left bottom chamber because of risks of clots and, and, and strokes. So we've traditionally put these wires through tiny little veins on the back sides of the heart. And uh, these wires are passively fit into these veins. However, not all of us have good veins on the back of the heart to implant these wires. And this has prohibited about 15 to 20% of folks uh, from getting this, this um, extra wire in the back of the heart. And why is this important? Because the heart normally or physiologically beats both chambers at the same time. When we're only stimulating one chamber versus the other, there's always a delay in activity in the left side of the heart. And this is, this is what we call dyssynchronous pacing or dyssynchronous contraction of the heart. The ventricles are not in synchrony. Uh, and in a lot of times we cannot get that wire, although we'd really like to get that wire to the left side. So you'll see on the next slide, um, this new technology that's up and coming and not available yet, but uh, we're lucky enough to uh, be gearing up to be part of the trial um, for, uh, for the implantation of this type of device, which is called the, uh, the Weiss device. And it is a small uh, pellet uh, like pacing device, which is implanted inside the ventricle directly. It's so small and it gets covered with the natural cells of the heart within the first four weeks that there really is not a source of risk or stroke um, when we implant these into directly into the ventricle. And what happens is they come and as you can see on the next slide with a small transducer in the um, uh, implanted under the skin and the chest. And what this transducer will do is we'll see what the traditional pacemaker wire is doing. And then it will fire off uh, a signal to the small implantable pellet and pace the left ventricle. So this way we're not relying on the small little veins on the back of the heart to sneak through and implant a wire. And we're using this new technology that can wirelessly pick up the signal and pace the left ventricle and regain uh, this wonderful synchrony that the heart uh, hungers for in certain times. Very important in our, in our patients who suffer from congestive heart failure. Um, so we're very excited to have this coming up. Uh, now the third milestone in pacing that is, is, uh, is becoming more and more popular and we're starting to um, be a part of uh, at uh, Banner University Medical Center is his bundle pacing. So. Uh, to a lot of people's dismay, I'm going to take you through a quick re a review of uh, the heart electrical system. And as you can see in the next slide, the wiring of the heart is, is quite simple. Um, there is a central wire, which you can see in green here, that uh, goes to the middle of the heart in a relay station ver form and then splits down into two big cables to the right and the left side of the heart. We call these the right bundles and the left bundles. And above these bundles before they split is a small electrical cable or nerve that we call the bundle of hiss. Now, a lot of times we have to implant pacemakers because this bundle of hiss becomes very diseased. And when we implant pacemakers, we cannot um, provide, we provide electricity to the heart, but again, it's not in a natural fashion. So you'll see on the next slide, we're starting to implant pacing wires directly into this bundle of hiss. Um, uh, another way for us to be able to provide synchrony for both lower chambers of the heart to beat simultaneously. Um, you know, this technology is not new. It's, it's, it's been around for quite some time. You know, this is the same wires that are implanted in, in the upper and lower chambers. 
but innovatively we're starting to implant them in the uh, directly into the nerve and hope to pace the nerve and that way we can use the electrical ca cables of the heart to transmit electricity down to the heart naturally. Um, so we're very excited to, to be performing this. And the last milestone I wanna discuss um, uh, in um, uh, today that is uh, becoming exceedingly mainstream in our practice at Banner University, and we think it's provided a lot for our patients over the course of the last few years, is remote monitoring. And I can't emphasize how important this is and how helpful this is for us to make our our patients' lives a lot more convenient and also our attention to uh, their changes in their heart rhythm um, as close to real time as possible and, and uh, uh, provide them with the attention needed as, as quickly as possible. Um, you'll see on the next slide uh, that um, uh, devices have been developed for us uh, to be able to monitor heart rhythms in folks without pacemakers or defibrillators. And this is just a small example and of implantable heart monitor, which is really the size of a small paper clip that we inject directly under the skin and monitors the heart rhythm. And this has been tremendously helpful in us making the appropriate diagnosis uh, for our patients with um, arrhythmias of the heart. And more importantly, on the next slide, you'll see that these devices now we can monitor with uh, your smartphone or with a small little uh, uh, um, uh, transmission unit that we ask folks to keep on their nightstand. Um, these devices are now Bluetooth enabled, just like your headsets or your microphone or your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, ear pods and, and uh, they can communicate with a phone uh, via Bluetooth and basically download the data from the heart rhythm and we get uh, e direct EKGs of the heart and can review what arrhythmias our patients are, are suffering from. Um, and this has been a tremendous uh, improvement in what we can, uh, the, the time it takes us to make a diagnosis. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that um, uh, monitoring is not only important for these uh, small heart monitors are very important for our patients with pacemakers and defibrillators. You know, as sophisticated as our devices are, they're still uh, uh, artificial devices that uh, can, um, uh, can uh, uh, demonstrate trouble or pick up arrhythmias that we want to know quickly um, about. And um, these devices are evolving to the point where our patients just download an app on their phone and we can tell if there's any problem with a pacemaker, any problem with their wires, any problem with interference from external sources or any arrhythmias that we need to know about sooner than later, especially when it comes to life-threatening arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia, which Dr. Weiss uh, talked about uh, um, ablation technology for, or uh, arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, which Dr. Sue talked uh, to us about, and the importance of diagnosis to prevent stroke and, uh, and complications of atrial fibrillation. We can pick up these devices, these arrhythmias in you know, within 24 to 48 hours of them occurring, where in the past we'd have to wait three months before we found out if anybody had an arrhythmia. Um, and, you know, more importantly, and on the last slide I want to I wanna bring up is, is um, these, these monitors uh, help us not only pick up arrhythmias, but they also help us tremendously in our uh, patients and who suffer from heart failure because these devices can, uh, for the most part, tell when uh, fluid starts to accumulate in the lungs. The lungs are the backyard of the heart and when the heart is not happy, the lungs fill up with fluid and we become short of breath. So our devices can have the, the technology using multiple algorithms and sensors to pick up uh, fluid accumulation, changes in the physiology of the heart. And we can tell when, when our patients are suffering from uh, volume overload and we're notified, um, you know, significantly uh, bo uh, before symptoms start to develop and we can prevent folks from going to hospitals and, um, and uh, reduce the amount of time spent in the hospitals. And also allows us to collaborate with our, um, with our uh, uh, colleagues in the heart failure department, advanced heart failure therapy and transplant doctors who, um, who we work very closely to um, and we can uh, provide them with information that's uh, valuable to, uh, to the care of their patients and uh, we can uh, address changes much sooner than, uh, than not. Um, so I really want to thank everybody for coming today and for being part of this and allowing us to uh, show you the great and exciting things that uh, we're doing at Banner University. 
um, both on the ablation and on the implantable device side. So, uh, Dr. Zwani, thank you very much. R really fascinating. Um, I, I want to ask you one question before we get to the general questions and answers. And I've seen there are some questions in the chat, so I'd, I'd, I'd like everyone to, to, uh, to add questions if they have them. Uh, and, and just, Mike, before I ask you the question, I just want to, I want you to remember the initial slide we, 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 we put up, which is this is, the, this is the essence of academic medicine. This is what what uh, happens inside Banner University Medical Center and, and what the university supports in terms of innovating technology, education, and research. You can see the, the need and the um, expertise and the drive that each of these individuals have to um, advance the field, to provide better, safer, uh, easier care. Um, and, and these are the kind of things that, that Trixie and Goldberg and the foundation are, are interested in helping us support. So Mike, I'm interested in the leadless, so leadless pacemaker. What's, so why not just have wires in your heart? What's the matter with wires in your heart? So uh, that's a, a great point, Dr. Fallon. So uh, wires in the heart over time uh, scar into the, into the veins. And uh, as they scar into the veins, uh, they can occlude the veins. And when veins become occluded, um, it makes it, uh, very tough in the future when our patients need a new wire or they need a more advanced device from uh, being able to upgrade the device um, and be, being able to advance the therapy uh, further. You know, as wonderful as these devices are, they have a, the devices have a longevity to them. You know, wires can fracture, wires can go bad. And, and really the wires in pacemakers and defibrillators are the weak link in the system. And if we can eliminate the weak link in the system uh, and the uh, more troublesome part of the system, we can really um, benefit our patients as much as possible. We hope in the future that we're gonna have completely wireless systems. And right now uh, we have a single chamber wireless system. There is, um, there is current development of two chamber wireless systems. And we're excited to the point that hopefully someday there's gonna be three, wire, you know, three chamber wireless systems but it's really avoiding implanting wires in vessels, keeps the blood vessels virgin. They allow us to uh, implant more advanced technology if our patients ever need them down the road and really avoid a lot of complications uh, uh, associated with long-term leads in our bodies. Good, thank you. So uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Um, and so um, we'll move to those. Uh, I, I wanna get to these questions. Uh, uh, because they're brought up by the by the participants. Um, so the first question uh, is for uh, you, Wilbur. Um, and the question is, is there an advantage or disadvantage of cryo-balloon ablation over radiation ablation on non-PV areas, more complex sources that are triggering atrial fibrillation? Sure, yeah, so this is kind of funny because a lot of people as I go around and uh, teach cryo-balloon ablation, one of the first thing they ask, do you do radio frequency ablation anymore? It's kind of funny to me because we, yeah, I do more probably radio frequency ablation than cryo ablation. It's really using the right tool in the right place. Um, Pulmonary vein isolation using radio frequency, I've done 2000 plus up before I changed that to cryo balloon ablation. It's just a very, very technically challenging procedure to do. I bet I can do it uh, better than most people I know. Uh, having done a lot of animal labs and everything, I know what it looks like. Uh, cryo, in short, is a very elegant way to uh, modify the tissue. It doesn't destroy the inner lining of the heart. There's less likely the chance to form a clot, and it's very forgiving as well. For example, we use cryo. I use cryo all the time to ablate a simple supraventricular tachycardia. And sometimes they are right next to a critical part of the heart called AV node. If we have a oops moment and just ablate that AV node, you have to have a pacemaker to support a heart rate. With using focal cryo, that will never happen because for freezing, when we start freezing, if the bad area goes away, the good area is all affected, we can stop, everything reverses in cryo. So it's a reversible ablation that, you know, that can test the blade. 
And if everything goes, all the bad area goes away and the good area stays good, we just keep on freezing for three, four minutes. It's actually a very relaxing procedure for us. We sit back, watch a bad area go away. It's actually very elegant. So the complication rate, you know, there are a lot of uh, radio frequency versus uh, um, uh, cryoablation trials out there. And uh, so we know the efficacy is great. We know the redo rate is much less for cryo balloons. And we know the complication is rather less. So really it's just a better way to do that type of procedure. One of the question mentions the extra pulmonary vein stuff. We actually wrote one of the first manuscript on that. <laughs> so we actually are quoted on how to do that with crowd balloon. Uh, but uh, really it's using all that uh, different tools for the right spot. You know, one of the things that uh, I have to say it's very, uh, nice here in the university setting is that, you know, well, we have no problem pulling both freezing and burning just to do the safest procedure in the fastest manner with the best outcome. And that's necessarily true in all institutions, you know, because they're focused on a few thousand dollar difference you know, as if that you know, translates to a safer outcome difference, right? So for us, that you know, whatever is worthwhile to have the best outcome, it's really our goal. And we have all the tools and uh, available right, to, to just do the best procedure. Great, thank you. So there's a question for uh, Dr. Weiss. So uh, Pete, are you, you now using magnetic guidance for all catheter ablations that you do? And if not, what percentage of your ablations are, are robotically done? And are there any disadvantages to, to using a robotic system? Yeah, so uh, there's always a tendency when new technology comes along to apply them to the most complicated things first. And so, you know, certainly that is uh, a piece of what comes along. Um, I would say probably 90% of what I do is done robotically. Um, the exception actually being the cryo balloon work that I do with, with uh, Dr. Sue, because uh, the balloon itself is not yet on a, a magnetic platform, although that could come uh, down the road. So I think that most limitations as far as things that are not being done robotically are because they haven't developed the compatible uh, technologies yet. Um, so, uh, but as I did mention, you know, we can certainly do the very complex things with it, but it, the importance in the long run and application to the more general population is to, you know, develop this tool for everyday use uh, and to demonstrate its efficiency as well as its safety and effectiveness. Um, and that's where bringing automation comes along, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the answer is yes, I use it for the vast majority of my procedures, uh, ablation procedures of all kinds, uh, except for doing uh, the cryo balloon work uh, that I do with uh, Dr. Sue. Any reason not to do it? Any risks, anybody you wouldn't do it on? Not really. I, you know, I think it really applies itself well to virtually every uh, arrhythmia. You know, there's a few exceptions potentially, but they're rare. And uh, really every, everything that can be done with a regular catheter uh, can be done with this system. And then there are a handful of cases uh, which really can't be done any other way except with the robotic system as well. Uh, so we've done some very unique procedures, patients who've waited, you know, a year or more to, to get a procedure done, for instance. So, um, no, it, it actually is incredibly uh, open to being used in many circumstances. It's also set up as an open platform uh, where uh, there's potential for compatibility with multiple other uh, providers of technology, including our mapping systems, and, and et cetera. We'll, uh, be adding new catheters, et cetera, down the road. Again, I'd love to see a cryo balloon put, put on this platform. We could drive it around inside the heart very easily. I'm sure Dr. Sue would love that as well. Um, you know, so uh, we'll stay tuned for more uh, technology to be added to the, to the platform as well. Great, great. So um, I know, uh, Trixie Ann, we're getting close to six o'clock. So what I, what I wanted to do was finish up by just thanking all of our speakers. Um, for really wonderful presentations about innovation, technology, education, research. I'd also like to thank everyone that's on uh, the, the, the meeting um, for, for coming and spending time to learn about what's going on and, and, and also to the Banner Foundation team, particularly Trixie Ann Goldberg for hosting us tonight. Um, and so Trixie Ann, I will, I will leave it to you to, uh, to, to tell everyone uh, good night and uh, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, doctors. This is just a wonderful conversation as promised. Thank you to all of our, all of our guests. And I hope that we'll be back for part two in 2021. Thank you all and be well. <laughs>